Now, I may be misremembering this, but when I read your book, one of the studies that seemed to hop out to me, and maybe I was having a fever dream, so please correct me, <laughs> but it was looking at sleep deprivation at different points after initial acquisition of knowledge. So you had students who were studying, and this may have been alcohol related as well, so you'll have to clarify mm -hmm. for me. But one might think sleep before learning important, yes, of course. Sleep, say, the night after learning, important, yes. But as I recall, it was something like three days later, if you interrupted the sleep, whether by deprivation or alcohol, that you subsequently saw lower recall mm -hmm. scores, something like that. Am I inventing yeah, this? No, your memory is pinpoint accurate. So your sleep is not perhaps quite as bad as one would <laughs> fear. You're right. So we've done these studies and there are perhaps two studies that speak to your point. One of the studies, you have people learn some information and then you deprive them of sleep the first night after learning. But then you don't test them. You give them all of the recovery sleep that they want on a second night and a third night, and then you test them. And what we find is that the memory recollection is still impaired out on day five. So in other words, if you don't sleep within the first 24 hours after learning, you lose the chance to consolidate those memories. So sleep for memory is an all or nothing phenomenon. And you know, if you're not snoozing that first night, you're losing and no amount of recovery sleep on the second or the third night was going to salvage the process because it seems as though that there is a selective time window of opportunity for consolidation. And if you miss it, unfortunately it's gone. So in that way, sleep isn't like the bank that you can't accumulate that debt and then try to pay it off at a later point in time. That was the first study. Then there was another study done by Carlisle Smith, a great memory researcher. We didn't do the study, but I, I'm so jealous because it's such a brilliant study. He was looking at different forms of sort of creative learning, which we know is more dependent on REM sleep. Learning facts, textbook information, and saving that stuff, that's about deep non-REM sleep. And we can speak about the mechanisms. When it comes to integrating and associating the information, as we spoke about, that's more about REM sleep. So he did a very clever study. He knew that one of the major consequences of alcohol's disruption on your sleep is not just that it sedates you, not just that it fragments your sleep, but it's very potent at blocking your dream sleep. And the reason is because of the aldehydes, the metabolic byproduct, and something called acetaldehyde is the main reason that your REM sleep is demolished by way of alcohol. And he was very interested in this idea because we knew at the time that REM sleep dreaming, REM sleep dreaming was associated with this type of creative memory. So he took a group of individuals and he separated them into about four or five different groups. And everyone learned this information on the first day, which required them to sort of create, it was actually very much like learning a novel language. It was an abstract mm -hmm. analogical language, almost like learning a computer code that's completely foreign to you. And it's not just about learning the individual pieces, it's understanding the grammatical rules of this big picture structure, associative. Mm -hmm. So they learned it on day one, and then out on day seven, they tested those individuals. So they learned it without any alcohol in their system, and then they were tested seven days later without any alcohol in the system. But here was the clever twist. One group, across those subsequent six nights, they slept normally with no alcohol. The second group, the first night after learning that information, they got them essentially just to the point of inebriation, to about the point of being blood alcohol illegal, you know, 0.08%. And it was body standardized dose across individuals. So you had one group, the control group. The second group, they got a little bit tipsy on night one. And then the subsequent nights, they were alcohol-free. Then there was a third group of individuals who had, they learned on day one, sober. Then they had natural sleep the first night, no drinking. Then they had natural sleep the second night and no drinking. And then on the third night, that's when they dosed them with alcohol. And then again, everyone was tested on day seven. And what did they find? Firstly, relative to the group that 
got a full night of good sleep every single night across the six nights. Their memory was still there. It was present. But in the group that had alcohol dosed on the first night, there was a greater than a 50% loss of their memory out on day seven because of the impact of alcohol on night one on REM sleep. But the frightening part was the night three group. So the, the third group, they were very good. They said, okay, I've been, let's say it's a student, you know, I've been learning on Wednesday and I've got all of this information. I'm not going to go out with my friends drinking on Wednesday night because sleep is important for memory. And then I'm not going to go out on Thursday night because I've just learned all this information. But then on Friday, surely my memories are now safe. I'm going to go out. I'm going to have a few drinks. Au contraire, because even alcohol on <laughs> night three caused almost the same. It was about a 40% deficit in memory. And what that tells us is not just something about alcohol. It tells us that the sleeping brain is still processing and consolidating and digesting information three days after the act of learning itself. So yeah, it was a great study and you've got a fantastic memory. Yeah. That's the one that blew me away. And I was like, oh my God, it's tough, isn't it? It's like, please come on. I know. Why does biology have to steal all the fun? 